Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Capital One Q3 2024 earnings call. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jeff Norris, Senior Vice President of Finance. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, Josh, and welcome, everyone. We're webcasting live over the Internet as usual, and to access the call on the Internet, please log on to Capital One's website at CapitalOne.com and follow the links from there. In addition to the press release and financials, we've included a presentation summarizing our third quarter 2024 results. With me today are Mr. Richard Fairbank, Capital One's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Andrew Young, Capital One's Chief Financial Officer. Rich and Andrew will walk you through this presentation. To access a copy of the presentation and the press release, please go to Capital One's website, click on Investors, then click on Financials, and then click on Quarterly Earnings Release. Please note that this presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Information regarding Capital One's financial performance and any forward-looking statements contained in today's discussion and the materials speak only as of the particular date or dates indicated in the materials. Capital One does not undertake any obligation to update or revise any of this information, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. Numerous factors could cause our actual results to differ materially from those described in forward-looking statements. And for more information on these factors, please see the section titled Forward-Looking Information in the Earnings Release Presentation and the Risk Factors section of our annual and quarterly reports accessible at Capital One's website and filed with the SEC. Now I'll turn the call over to Mr. Young. Andrew? Hey, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. I will start on slide three of tonight's presentation. In the third quarter, Capital One earned $1.8 billion, or $4.41 per diluted common share. Included in the results for the quarter were adjusting items related to Discover integration costs and a small downward revision to our FDIC special assessment estimate. Net of these adjusting items, third quarter earnings per share were $4.51. Pre-provision earnings in the third quarter increased 3% from the second quarter to $4.7 billion. Revenue in the linked quarter increased 5%, driven by higher net interest income. Non-interest expense increased 7%, driven by increases in both operating expense and marketing spend. Provision for credit losses was $2.5 billion in the quarter, down $1.4 billion relative to the prior quarter. The quarterly decrease was primarily driven by the absence of the second quarter's one-time allowance build for the termination of the Walmart partnership, a decline in the coverage ratio in card, and a $40 million decrease in net charge-offs. Turning to slide four, I will cover the allowance in greater detail. We released $134 million in allowance this quarter, and our allowance balance now stands at $16.5 billion. Our total portfolio coverage ratio decreased seven basis points to 5.16%. The decrease in this quarter's allowance and coverage ratio was largely driven by allowance releases in our card and consumer banking segments. I'll cover the drivers of the changes in allowance and coverage ratio by segment on slide five. In our domestic card business, we released $66 million of allowance, which decreased coverage by 18 basis points to 8.36%. Our credit outlook has improved slightly as our confidence in the stability of underlying credit trends has grown, driving a modest release in allowance. In our consumer banking segment, we released $50 million in allowance, resulting in a 10 basis point decrease to our coverage ratio. The release was driven by strong credit performance and increasing recoveries in our auto business. And finally, our commercial banking allowance decreased by $14 million, resulting in the coverage ratio remaining essentially flat at 1.76%. Turning to page six, I'll now discuss liquidity. 
Total liquidity reserves in the quarter increased about $9 billion to approximately $132 billion. Our cash position ended the quarter at approximately $49 billion, up about $4 billion from the prior quarter, driven primarily by continued strong deposit growth. Our preliminary average liquidity coverage ratio during the third quarter was 163%, up from 155% in the second quarter. Turning to page seven, I'll cover our net interest margin. Our third quarter net interest margin was 7.11%, 41 basis points higher than last quarter and 42 basis points higher than the year ago quarter. The sequential increase in NIM was largely the result of three factors. First, we had higher card and auto yields. As a reminder, the card yield benefited from a full quarter impact of the termination of the revenue sharing agreement with Walmart. The removal of revenue sharing increased the total company NIM by 12 basis points quarter over quarter and 22 basis points relative to the year ago quarter. Second, there was one additional day in the third quarter. And finally, we had a higher mix of card loans on the balance sheet. Turning to slide eight, I will end by discussing our capital position. Our common equity tier one capital ratio ended the quarter at 13.6%, 40 basis points higher than the prior quarter. Higher net income in the quarter was partially offset by the impact of dividends, loan growth, and $150 million of share repurchases. As a reminder, the announcement of the acquisition of Discover constituted a material business change. Therefore, we continue to be subject to the Federal Reserve's pre-approval of our capital actions until the merger, merger approval process has concluded. With that, I will turn the call over to Rich. Mm-hmm. Rich? Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, Slide 10 shows third quarter results in our credit card business. Credit card segment results are largely a function of our domestic card results and trends, which are shown on slide 11. In the third quarter, our domestic card business delivered another quarter of top-line growth, strong margins, and stable credit. Year-over-year purchase volume growth for the quarter was 5%. Ending loan balances increased $9.1 billion, or about 6% year-over-year. Average loans increased about 7%. And third quarter revenue was up 10%, driven by the growth in purchase volume and loans. Revenue margin for the quarter increased 43 basis points year over year to 18.7%. The full quarter effect of the end of the Walmart revenue sharing agreement drove a 51 basis point year over year increase. Excluding this impact, the revenue margin would have been about 18.2%. The charge off rate for the quarter was 5.61%. The full quarter impact of the end of the Walmart loss sharing agreement increased the quarterly charge off rate by 38 basis points. Excluding this impact, the charge off rate for the quarter would have been 5.23%, up 83 basis points uh, year over year. The 30 plus delinquency rate at quarter end was 4.53%, up 22 basis points from the prior year. As a reminder, the end of the Walmart loss sharing agreement did not have a meaningful impact on the delinquency rate. The pace of year-over-year increases in both the charge-off rate and the delinquency rate have been steadily declining for several quarters and continued to shrink in the third quarter. On a sequential quarter basis, the charge-off rate, excluding the Walmart impact, was down 63 basis points and the 30-plus delinquency rate was up 39 basis points. Both sequential quarter trends are consistent with seasonal expectations. 
Domestic card non-interest expense was up 12% compared to the third quarter of 2023, primarily driven by higher marketing expense. Total company marketing expense in the quarter was $1.1 billion, up 15% year over year. Our choices in domestic card are the biggest driver of total company marketing. We continue to see compelling growth opportunities in our domestic card business. Our marketing continues to deliver strong new account growth across the domestic card business. Compared to the third quarter of 2023, domestic card marketing in the quarter included increased marketing to grow originations at the top of the market, higher media spend, and increased investment in differentiated customer experiences like our travel portal, airport lounges, and Capital One shopping. Slide 12 shows third quarter results in our consumer banking business. Auto originations were up 23% year over year in the third quarter. Our stable credit performance, which is the result of choices we've made over the past couple of years puts us in a strong position to lean into current origination opportunities in the marketplace. Consumer banking ending loans were essentially flat year over year and average loans were down 1%. On a linked quarter basis, ending loans and average loans were both up 1%. Compared to the year ago quarter, both ending and average consumer deposits were up about 6%. Consumer banking revenue for the quarter was down about 3% year over year, largely driven by higher deposit costs compared to the prior year quarter. Non-interest expense was up about 5% compared to the third quarter of 2023, driven largely by continued technology investments and increased auto originations. The auto charge-off rate for the quarter was 2.05%, up 28 basis points year-over-year. The 30-plus delinquency rate was 5.61%, down 3 basis points year-over-year, largely as the result of our choice to tighten credit and pull back in 2022. Auto charge-offs have been strong and stable. Slide 13 shows third quarter results for our commercial banking business. Compared to the linked quarter, ending loan balances decreased about 2%. Average loans were down about 1%. The modest declines are largely the result of choices we made in 2023 to to tighten credit. Ending deposits were up about 5% from the linked quarter. Average deposits were down about 1%. We continue to manage down selected, less attractive commercial deposit balances. Third quarter revenue was up 1% from the linked quarter and non-interest expense was up by about 2%. The commercial banking annualized net charge-off rate for the third quarter increased seven basis points from the sequential quarter to 0.22%. The commercial banking criticized Performing loan rate was six was seven point six six percent, down ninety six basis points compared to the linked quarter. The criticized non-performing loan rate increased nine basis points to one point five five percent. In closing, we continued to post strong results in the third quarter. We delivered another quarter of top line growth in domestic card loans, purchase volume and revenue. In the auto business, we saw year-over-year growth in originations for the third consecutive quarter, and consumer credit trends remained stable. Our year-to-date operating efficiency ratio, net of adjustments through September, was 41.7%. We had guided to 2024 annual operating efficiency ratio, net of adjustments, to be modestly down compared to the 43.5% we posted in 2023. Our view included the positive impact from the end of the revenue sharing related to the Walmart partnership and assumed the CFPB late fee rule would take effect in October. Looking forward, we now expect the full year 2024 annual operating efficiency ratio net of adjustments to be in the low 42s. 
we expect a sequential quarter increase in operating expense in the fourth quarter that will be roughly in line with historical patterns as we continue to invest in our technology transformation. And we are no longer assuming that the CFPB late fee rule will be implemented in 2024, given ongoing uncertainty around industry litigation. Our view of 2024 marketing has not changed. We continue to lean into marketing to grow and to further strengthen our franchise. In the domestic card business, we continue to get traction in originations across our products and channels. In consumer banking, we're leaning into marketing to grow our digital first national banking franchise. We continue to expect total company marketing in the second half of 2024 to be meaningfully higher than in the first half, similar to the pattern we saw last year. And that includes the much higher marketing levels that we typically see in the fourth quarter. And turning to the Discover acquisition, we're working closely with the regulators as our applications continue to work their way through the regulatory approval process. Separately, Discover mentioned in their press release and on their earnings call last week that they continue to work in parallel with the SEC to resolve comments regarding their accounting approach for their card misclassification matter. As soon as that process wraps up, we expect to mail out a joint proxy and a schedule uh, and to, to schedule a shareholder vote, most likely early next year. We remain well positioned to get shareholder and regulatory approvals, and we expect to be in a position to complete the acquisition early in 2025, subject to regulatory and shareholder approval. Pulling way up, the acquisition of Discover is a singular opportunity. It will create a consumer banking and global payments platform with unique capabilities, modern technology, powerful brands, and a franchise of more than 100 million customers. It delivers compelling financial results and offers the potential to enhance competition and create significant value for merchants and customers. And now we'll be happy to answer your questions. Jeff. Thank you, Rich. We will now start the Q&A session. Remember, as a courtesy to other investors and analysts who may wish to ask a question, please limit yourself to one question plus a single follow-up. If you have any further questions after the Q&A session, the Investor Relations team will be available after the call. Josh, please start the Q&A. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. One moment for our first question. And our first question comes from Ryan Nash with Goldman Sachs. You may proceed. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Brian. So, Rich, maybe to just start on credit, you know, you obviously have uh, you can see lots of different parts of the consumer market, you know, high-end consumer, subprime, prime, private label, different parts of auto. And you guys seem to be bucking the trend with really solid credit results, so I think some others aren't. So maybe can you just talk about what you're seeing across, uh, across consumer and some of these different cohorts, and, and maybe what do you think it means for, you know, where losses could be headed in, you know, some of your main asset classes? Thanks. I have a follow-up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so let me just pull up and, and just talk uh, first about the health of the consumer. You know, I think the U.S. consumer remains a source of relative strength in the overall economy. You know, think about this. The labor market remains strong. Uh, you, know, we saw, you know, we saw signs of softening in the first half of 2024, and the unemployment rate ticked up a bit. But the most recent data points on unemployment and job creation have actually shown renewed strength. Incomes are growing in real terms, and last month we saw a significant upward revision of the savings rate. Consumer debt servicing burdens are stable relative to pre-pandemic levels, and consumers have higher average bank account balances than before the pandemic. Now, we see some pockets of pressure related to sort of the cumulative effects of inflation and elevated interest rates. And we are almost certainly still seeing 
a thing that you know we we've been uh, calling out uh, for years, uh, even really before it happened, saying we think it inevitably will happen, and uh, but we won't fully be able to measure that. We won't be able to measure that along the way, but that is delayed charge-offs from the pandemic period. You know, we should remember that millions of consumers who would have charged off under normal circumstances in 2020, 2021, and, and 2022 avoided defaulting thanks to unprecedented stimulus and forbearance. And these consumers were on the edge and they got a lifeline, but you know, for some of them, their underlying vulnerability remains. So I believe that what we're seeing today is some catching up from that period of historically low charge offs. So I'd say consumers on the whole are in good shape compared to most historical benchmarks, but I do think there's some pockets of pressure that will persist until we fully work through this, um, you know, the, 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 this cycle essentially of, of inflation and elevated interest rates. And of course, for an unmeasurable period of time, the, the, there will be, I think, this delayed charge off effect from the pandemic. So that's a comment, Ryan, sort of on the consumer generally. You said you had another question. Of course, I can get into Capital One's individual uh, credit as well. But uh, why don't I uh, hear where you want to take this? Yeah, and it, it would be helpful if, uh, if if you can comment on Capital One specifically. But maybe I'll throw out another question for Andrew, um, and you guys can, can handle both of them. So, Andrew, obviously there was a big beat on the net interest margin. And, you know, the Fed is has begun easing. I'm just curious if you could maybe just talk about the drivers and expectations from the margin for the margin from here. And just given, you know, you've historically operated in this kind of 6-8 or 6-9 range, but given the balance sheet, the changing balance sheet dynamics, do you think we've sort of broken out of that range. Thanks. Yeah, Ryan, look, as I think about the, the NIM in the near, near term, you know, I enumerated the driving forces of what led to the increase this quarter. But in the, the near term, you know, outside of, of seasonal effects, uh, we have one modest uh, likely headwind, which, as you can see in our disclosures, is that, you know, we're asset sensitive. And so uh, that that will put a bit of pressure uh, on NIM in the immediate term. But we also have uh, one potential tailwind, I'll call it, uh, and that is the, the pace of card growth relative to the rest of the balance sheet. And you've seen that be a tailwind to NIM, uh, all else equal, over the last few quarters. Longer term, I think there's – you know, a few headwinds and, and tailwinds, the tailwind being, again, card even beyond the next few quarters. We've seen strong growth, particularly relative to the, the rest of our balance sheet. Um, I've highlighted in the past that our current levels of cash are likely above where we think they will eventually settle out. And if we were to see a steepening of the yield curve, uh, that's also a, a good guy to us, all else equal. Uh, on the on the headwind side, I think there's a question of where betas go from here, and there's a possibility that they could be you know slower or lower depending on a host of, of factors. Um, we could maintain cash levels. Um, for some period of time, at least, especially in light of the strong deposit growth we're, we're seeing. And then always there's a little bit of a wild card of the path of, of credit, right? And so if for some reason it stays elevated, the potential revenue suppression could be a headwind. But, you know, overall, I, I would say taking all of those factors I into account, um, you've kind of seen the stability over the last few quarters prior to this one in a step up uh, here in the third quarter, and so you know, I'll let you kind of weigh all of the the, the headwinds and tailwinds that I just laid out for you. Thank you. So, Ryan, let me just—I talk generally about the consumer. Let me talk uh, a little bit about um, Capital One specifically. What we see, and and uh, uh, this is 
of course, partly because of what I just said about the consumer and some Capital One specific things as well. So in the card business, um, we, you know, our, our delinquencies and uh, charge offs are consistent with normal seasonality now. And it's clear that our card credit has settled out. It's also clear that it settled out above pre-pandemic levels. And sort of there's, there's three main reasons for this. Uh, first, we still have relatively lower recoveries compared to before the pandemic as a result of he- historically low charge-offs in the rearview mirror and therefore in our charge-off inventory. So our recovery rate per dollar of charge-offs has been stable, if anything, in fact, a a bit better than before the pandemic, but just the inventory remains below pre-pandemic levels, but it's, it's rising. It's, 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 you know, heading toward uh, returning to the uh, pre-pandemic levels. So, uh, you know, this effect will diminish over the next few quarters, um, you know, uh, we, we would expect. Secondly, you know, the, we believe the cumulative effects of inflation and higher interest rates are creating affordability pressures for some consumers, particularly those whose incomes have not kept pace with inflation or have higher debt servicing burdens. So we think that's a factor. And, you know, to your point, I'm, I'm actually not making a point about the low end of the market, whether measured by income or credit score, generally speaking, we've seen stronger relative income growth at the lower end of the distribution since 2020. And, um, you know, customers with the highest debt servicing burdens tend uh, to skew more uh, prime than subprime. So, and then, and then, of course, the other factor, uh, you know, that we would point at as to why charge-offs are settling out above the pre-pandemic levels is the delayed charge-off effect that we think is still uh, playing through. Just back, if I could just throw in an industry point just for a second, I I should have mentioned this uh, probably earlier because this isn't really a Capital One effect, but I think that what we see in industry data is that post-pandemic origination vintages are running at higher risk level than pre-pandemic vintages, probably because of inflated credit scores during the pandemic. And, you know, that's, that's, that's an industry point, not a Capital One point because, and then here, Ryan, is when you mentioned that you're seeing Capital One credit in some cases move differently uh, from some of the industry trends. You know, at Capital One, we anticipated uh, these uh, effects, um, you know, related to some of the unusual things going on during the pandemic and particularly the, in, it, it, what we might say is the great inflation of credit scores. So we tightened our underwriting back in 2020 and 21 when credit was the best we've ever seen. And as credit normalized, we continued to make adjustments where we saw pockets of rising risk. What I was saying along the the way where we kept trimming around the edges. So the result for Capital One has been relatively stable performance on our recent originations now for uh, for a long time, which are really running at similar levels of risk to pre-pandemic vintages. But I do think there is some underlying worsening in the marketplace that uh, that that may be showing up elsewhere that some of our choices uh, were able to uh, offset. So, you know, pulling way up uh, our credit results, we feel are strong and stable, driven by the choices that we've made as uh, through the pandemic and the post pandemic uh, period. And. Um, we feel, um, you know, very good about where we are. And it's an important reason that we are, you know, leaning in, as you can see, in terms of our originations in the business. I can talk about auto at some point, but but maybe I'll, I'll wait for another question on that. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sanjay Sakrani with KBW. You may proceed. 
Thank you. Good evening. Um, just uh, following up on credit, um, sorry. Just, Rich, you had mentioned, maybe it was last quarter or the quarter before, that you, we, we should start to see um, the credit, the delinquency improvements do better than seasonality. Uh, and I guess stabilized at, you know, it's moving along with seasonality. Is, is some of that related to the stuff you were just talking about, or do you still expect the improvement to be better than seasonality at some point? Well, well at some point, of course, um, you know, um, can be a long time. But it, it, no, let, let me just say that I don't, re, I don't recall saying that we expected credit to be better than seasonality. I think what we have been saying over the last number of months it's for a long time, we said credit is normalizing. We are on the absolute lookout for the very early signs of credit normalizing, which it should, where exactly it will normalize, you know, who knows till we actually get there. And so way back to more than a year ago, um, uh, starting interestingly in the lower end of the market, we, we um, were pointing out that we see the signs of credit stabilizing, of course, uh, we all went down that uh, ski slope of second derivative, and that uh, continues to, you know, to uh, be a strong effect. But the, these are all um, things, Sanjay, that are going on related to credit stabilizing, um, and and we have not uh, we have not declared that that we think, um, you know, credit is in fact. You know, headed down from here. At some point, uh, we we can uh, in another question. You know, go through the the potential um, you know case uh, for that. Um, I want to say one other thing, though. You mentioned seasonality, and um, I put a marker down um, last quarter about a potential seasonality, um, a change in seasonality patterns, and I'd like to just kind of seize the moment. Um, and comment on this because I think all of you that are watching uh, the credit patterns on a monthly basis, it's really important that we talk about the the seasonality benchmark uh, to which to compare that. So let's talk for a moment about how seasonality works. Um, you know, our portfolio, in fact, tends to have more pronounced seasonal patterns than the industry average. The second quarter tends to be the seasonal low point for delinquencies, and the fourth quarter tends to be the seasonal high point. Card losses lag relative to delinquencies. The losses tend to be seasonally lowest in the third quarter and highest in the first quarter. Now, we we have always thought and still do that tax refunds are a significant driver of these seasonal trends. And tax refunds drive a large seasonal improvement in delinquent payments in the February-March time period, which flows through to lower delinquencies in April, May, and then to lower charge-offs in the August-September time frame. Tax, tax refunds also drive a seasonal uptick in our recoveries. Now, a few years ago, the tax withholding rules changed leading to fewer tax refunds and lower average refund payments. And the IRS was paying certain refunds later than before because of fraud-related uh, issues that they had seen. Now, so we were watching all this, but there was so much noise in the payment data due to the pandemic that we were unsure to what extent credit seasonality patterns had changed. So in the first half of this year, as credit metrics settled out, we flagged that the combined effect of lower and later tax refunds, as the, you know, the more it settles out, the more we can sort of see these underlying patterns, that we flagged that this combined effect was likely affecting our near-term credit performance by delaying and muting the usual seasonal improvement that we see in the second quarter. But we didn't want to go to the highest mountaintop and declare that because we wanted to make sure we weren't explaining away credit numbers that, in fact, looked uh, worse than, than seasonally what you would expect. We also at the time, you know, um, believed that we would see more muted 
seasonal increases in delinquencies in the third quarter on the other side of that effect. And we've now had several quarters to look at this, and that experience has been confirmatory. And now that, you know, we're, in a sense, credit is coming in better than the old seasonal patterns. Um, so we've seen both the worst side and the better side. Um, you know, I think uh, we can pull up and really sort of declare this effect really seems to be happening. You know, 2024 settled out with fewer refunds paid than before the pandemic and about 25% lower total refund volume in real uh, terms. So, uh, so what, what we're basically uh, seeing and, and uh, pulling way up is that seasonality, which has, we believe is driven uh, predominantly by tax refunds, as tax refunds become less of an effect, not surprisingly, in fact, we're seeing seasonality that has less amplitude to it. So that's, you know, I think the seasonality that we observe now and when we've done sort of a um, an adjusted look at last year, we, we definitely think uh, that we see the, the new uh, trend. Uh, by the way, on the auto side, all of this happens in auto seasonality, but in an even faster and more concentrated way. Uh, so, um, so I think I just wanted to share that uh, with you. But um, I think what we've really been uh, declaring here, Sanjay, is that it's it's there's just such a confirmation that that credit uh, is really settling out here. To me, my follow-up question would be the, the question you were looking for later. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what's the path to normalization? And I guess for credit as well as the reserve rate, you know, we're well above uh, the levels we were in 2019. Maybe you and, and Andrew can tag team on that one. Thank you. Um, so uh, why don't I start, uh, Andrew? So the... Uh, you know, we're really, really pleased with how uh, card credit is uh, settled out after, you know, a, quite a period of uh, normalization. So looking ahead, while we're not giving guidance, you know, on future credit, I just want to point out a number of forces that play out. So the, you know, one force, of course, is the, this thing that we believe so strongly is there, but we can't measure it, is the phenomenon of delayed uh, charge-offs. You know, if you kind of look at the area under the curve of all the charge-offs that sort of uh, didn't happen, now we don't believe all of that area will play out over time, but, but, you know, if you look at the area below the curve and compare it to the area, in a sense, above the curve now, uh, one can see that conceptually there could be still quite a bit of, in a sense, uh, delayed inventory that could happen. Uh, I just want to flag that effect. I think it's going to moderate at, you know, at some point, but, uh, um, you know, I think that effect will be with us from, for some time. Another factor is the recoveries inventory that continues to rebuild and that should be a gradual tailwind to our losses over time, all as, all else being equal. And then the moderating of inflation. Uh, I, I think is, you know, a good guy for card credit, but still high interest rates are probably a source of pressure at the tails for, for some uh, consumers, especially those with higher debt servicing uh, burdens. And, of course, the economy will be a factor, too. But uh, those are just some of the forces I think are going to be at work uh, as, uh, as credit plays out here, Sanjay. And then with respect to allowance, uh, Sanjay, obviously we'll be allowing for growth. So that's the, the starting point on a dollar basis. I suspect you are more focused on coverage. So let me talk in, in coverage terms first and just very tactically as a reminder near term. Um, the fourth quarter, we typically have uh, seasonally higher balances and those balances just have lower coverage because of the 
high levels of expected payment. So all else equal, and I stress that point, but that would put downward pressure on coverage in the fourth quarter. But I, uh, in hearing your question, I think you're looking for a longer-term view. So first, the coverage over time is going to primarily be driven by our loss forecast and our confidence in those estimates. And so Rich just kind of shared the, the things that we'll be uh, looking for and, and what will ultimately be driving those, those forecasts. But uh, how the allowance then plays out relative to that, I think it's important to note that even uh, if we find ourselves in, in future quarters where our projected losses are lower than the projected losses in the current uh, quarter's forecast, we might see only modest declines in coverage as we incorporate uncertainties related to, uh, to those projections. But, you know, eventually the, that lower loss forecast, if, it, if and when it, it comes through, um, uh, would, you know, theoretically flow through the allowance and uh, bring the coverage ratio down as, you know, those uncertainties become more certain. And so the direction of travel in that scenario would, would be down. The pace and timing would obviously depend on a, a variety of factors. Because you mentioned, though, Cecil Day 1, I guess I'll end, Sanjay, just as a reminder, one other call out. Um, you know, using Cecil Day 1 as a, a rough proxy for, you know, a through the cycle coverage assumption, um, it's important to note that embedded in Cecil Day 1 was the law sharing agreement with Walmart. And so with the termination of that agreement, the roughly 50 basis point impact to allowance coverage that we recognized last quarter. Um, I just want to make sure that as you're thinking about, you know, Cecil day one, excluding the, the Walmart uh, effect, that six and a half roughly percent is actually more like seven. Hopefully that, that gives you though a sense of the, the direction of travel. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Terry Ma with Barclays. You may proceed. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Um, I wanted to touch on the auto business and ask um, kind of what you're seeing in a competitive environment and how you're thinking about growth going forward. You called out no originations have been positive the last three quarters, and it looks like loan growth is going to turn positive. Um, I know you're still mindful of used car prices, so should we expect more measured growth in auto going forward? So, uh, yeah, thank you, Terry. Um, you know, our auto originations, uh, as you say, they've been, uh, they've been growing now. I guess it's uh, the last uh, three quarters. Um, and as we stated in our prior calls, in 2022 and in early 2023, we had anticipated risk and pullback, you know, on our originations. And even as the vehicle values have been declining, the credit performance on both our front book and our back book remains, um, you know, uh, very strong. So additionally, just, just talking about some industry factors, some of the headwinds that the industry has been facing with high interest rates and high vehicle prices are now easing as the interest rates have started to come down and vehicle values are down from their peak, although both of these remain higher than pre-pandemic levels. So interest margins uh, on our, uh, also very important, interest margins on our front book have increased and credit has stabilized and we're seeing opportunities to grow in a resilient way. So our strategy is to lean into areas that we like, and that is supported by our uh, very sophisticated underwriting and technology infrastructure, our data-driven decisioning, as well as deep uh, relationships with our dealer network. So looking ahead, we feel good about our auto business, and we feel we are well-positioned to grow in a disciplined way, targeting particularly what we think is the very resilient business. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Next question, please. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Bill Carcacci with Wolf Research Securities. You may proceed. Bill, your line is now open. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Rich and Andrew. Um, following up on your NIM commentary, Andrew, if credit continues to trend in line or potentially better than normal seasonality from here, is it reasonable to expect revenue suppression would begin to serve as more of a NIM tailwind uh, that would arguably overwhelm some of the NIM headwinds that you described in your earlier response? Outside of seasonality, Bill, which is an important qualifier to that, but yes, to the extent that you know, credit is coming down in an absolute sense. Suppression is highly correlated with, with loss rates. So over a period of time, that's what we would expect to see. Thanks. And then also another follow-up for you, Andrew, on your reserve commentary. In prior quarters, qualitative overlays, it, it, it seems, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like it had the effect of preventing you from releasing reserves. Is it fair to conclude that this quarter's uh, you know, reserve release suggests you, you expect consumer credit conditions to continue to gradually improve from here to the point where you know, that would support peak losses likely being, uh, or sorry, peak reserve rates likely being uh, behind us at this point? It, it's hard to think about uh, the qualitative factors in isolation, Bill, because we look at the totality of the forecast and the economic backdrop, um, and that's just, you know, one, albeit important, but component of thinking about the the uh, allowance overall. So really the release this quarter was driven by, you know, the, the, the stability of underlying credit trends and just our, our confidence in those trends. So that, that's really the driver that, uh, that, that led to this quarter's release. Uh, thank you for taking please. my questions. Thanks. Thank next you. question, please. Our next question comes from Don Fandetti with Wells Fargo. You may proceed. Hi, uh, Rich. On the Discover merger, um, do you still feel like owning a network helps your position with regulatory approval? I mean, I guess the DOJ suit against Visa does validate that. I'm just trying to get a, a sense on whether or not you feel like your arguments are resonating with regulators and you have confidence in, in the deal closing. So um, I think it's... You know, this is an unusual deal in the sense that usually there is, you know, a player player in a certain industry um, doing an acquisition of another player in that industry, and certain certainly a part of the consideration is looking at those aspects. But the, the very unusual uh, part here is two things. First of all, uh, one is such an important part of this acquisition is um, buying a network, something that we don't have, so we're not even in that part of the business. Uh, but then uh, secondly, of course, it is, uh, you know, an acquisition, buying a position in an industry that is, um, you know, getting a tremendous amount of scrutiny for how concentrated it is and the network that we are acquiring uh, for example, on the credit card side, has gone from 6% down to 4% share in, in recent years. And uh, so uh, certainly we are making uh, a strong case that, um, uh, you know, to a, to a regulator that obviously has shown they, they care a lot about competition in that marketplace that, you know, we certainly believe that, uh, this is um, uh, very pro-competitive uh, in that sense. Of course, we also believe very much that uh, on the credit card side, uh, the deal is pro-competitive as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Heck with Jeffries. You may proceed. Afternoon, guys. Thanks very much for taking my questions. Um, most of them have been asked and answered. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can maybe give us um, some color on spend trends, the built business volumes. Uh, um, you know, we've heard that there's that the consumers being a little bit more 
uh, cautious and careful or responsible with their spending um, as opposed to reacting to some sort of weakness or concerns about the economy. And I'm wondering what your opinion is on that and how that affects your business. So, uh, John, uh, thank you. The you know, consumer spending has had a little bit of a wild ride over the past uh, few years. So just to reflect for a second on this, at the start of the pandemic, spend uh, per customer plummeted. Then it surged as consumers resumed their spending, and it has since been settling out. Since the beginning of 2023, our spend per customer has remained largely flat uh, overall, although it has begun to tick up in uh, recent months. So the spend growth that you see uh, for Capital One is really being driven by the growth in new accounts and the spending on those accounts. And, um, you know, and then we see just a little bit of a, of a, a, a tick up in the last uh, few months. Just to, while I know some people have kind of wondered if you double click into the spend patterns, you know, discretionary and non-discretionary spend have really, um, the, the growth rates of them have been very uh, stable. Um, uh, lately, and in fact, the mix has been stable across incomes and FICOs and is in line with pre-pandemic levels. So we think things really have settled out in the, in the, in the card business with respect to spend. And, you know, when we, it, it, it's really striking when we look at banking overall and, you know, pretty much the only industry that's really growing is the credit card uh, industry and it's it's been a tough way to make a living in you know most of the banking uh, uh, product areas and um, that of course I think the credit card continues to um, you know be part of a very a very important and multi-decade um, uh, macro trend with respect to um, the uh, movement out of cash and checks and really into the incredibly convenient spending uh, mechanisms of a credit card. So I think there's, there's sort of a macro tailwind that continues to help um, the industry. And then I think for a lot of us companies, certainly a few of us, companies like Capital One, uh, our strategies are very uh, focused. Uh, it's what I, I call a, a spend first uh, strategy so that a, a lot of what we do, the choices we make on the marketing side, on the credit side, and really the business we want to be uh, has a, a spend first uh, lean to it, and um, that uh, that that's another um, benefit to uh, our metrics. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate the color. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mihir Bhatia with Bank of America. You may proceed. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. And actually, just following up kind of similar lines as John's question about spending, maybe just drilling down specifically on the Venture X portfolio. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about it. It's been in the market for a couple of years now. Just how, how much has it grown? How material is it to the overall card business? What are you seeing in terms of performance in that portfolio that's encouraging you to invest more in it? Or just any additional details would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, here. So we launched our Venture X card uh, in late 2021, and we're very pleased with the market response and the customer engagement uh, so far. Uh, this launch is, of course, a continuation uh, in our journey that's been many years in the making to win at the top of the market. And that journey, you know, started years ago with a declaration. And then we have continued to just uh, sort of uh, every year stretch a little higher and uh, lean in um, um, to the momentum and the brand uh, 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 strength that we were getting 
and our market position to be able to keep growing. So VentureX was a very important uh, milestone in that journey. Um, and also, you know, very important in that journey to win at the top of the market was the launch of our Capital One travel portal and the opening of Capital One lounges, uh, as well as enhancements to our customers, you know, overall experience more broadly. So, and, and uh, you, I'm sure you saw that actually in the third quarter of last year, we then launched the Venture X business card, and we're also pleased with the market response and customer engagement uh, so far uh, as well. So uh, I guess the way, the way, while we don't give out the specific numbers on this, uh, we continue to be very pleased with our quest to win at the top of the market, and both of these um, uh, VentureX uh, products are, um, you know, getting uh, a, a lot of uh, traction so far. And uh, as you can see, we're we're leaning in uh, quite a bit. But again, the, what I what I want to say is, I think one of the mistakes that card companies sometimes make is to think about a quest to win at the top of the market related to we're going to launch a particular product with these features. I really want to stress that uh, winning at the top of the market uh, requires a sustained, uh, comprehensive uh, effort um, to uh, create experiences, access to uh, things that, that are, are unique and, and sort of something to tell your friends about, um, lounges, um, uh, digital uh, experience, uh, rewards, of course, um, and, um, and then a very important component of this is uh, building the brand credibility to have uh, be viewed as a uh, premium player in that part of the marketplace. So all of that is, is uh, you know, what we're investing in. You've, of course, seen, um, you know, quite an increase in our marketing, uh, it, uh, and a fair amount of that is in service of uh, our continued quest at the top of the market. But I would leave this one uh, observation with you as well, is that while you see the overall purchase uh, volume growth rate uh, for Capital One, um, it, when we when we break that data up by spend segment, basically the higher the the spend segment, meaning the higher we reach up in the marketplace, the faster our growth rate is, which is a, a confirmation of the traction we're getting, but also it, not only in overall volume, but the traction that we're getting uh, reaching uh, farther up. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chase Haynes with Evercore ISI. You may proceed. Hi, it's uh, John Payne Carey at Evercore ISI. Um, wanted to just uh, ask on capital uh, CET1 ratio at 13.6. Uh, I wanted to get your updated thoughts here on on how you think about buyback in that context. Now, I know you had indicated that the Discover transaction could impact the pace of buybacks ultimately, but um, you, you still you know, bought back about $150 million in the third quarter. So I wanted to get your updated thoughts there. Thanks. Yeah, John, look, there's uh, a few forces at play that impact how we think about you know, capital management, the, the first, of course, being the uncertainty around the end game rule, you know, the reproposal provided some high level indications, uh, but the devil's in the details there, not to mention the uncertainty on implementation timing. Um, you know, second, although it's been moderating, of course, you know, there still continues to be a, a degree of macroeconomic uncertainty. Uh, but, but last and perhaps most importantly, we have the pending uh, Discover acquisition. And so post-close, we will need to run both our internal assessment of the needs of the combined company, but we'll also go through the Fed's CCAR process to come up with our view and the Fed's view of the, the combined 
uh, capital need, uh, combined company uh, entities capital need. Um, so uh, th- those are uh, the reasons why we're, um, you know, operating at, at current levels and believe it's, it's prudent to do so. Um, and we've been at this $150 million apace for a number of, of quarters. Um, once we are back, under an SCB regime, you know, we'll of course have flexibility to return capital as uh, as we see appropriate. And you saw in late 2021 and, and early 22 when we had excess capital, we were returning that at you know something like two and a half billion a quarter in in repurchases. So if we were to find ourselves in a similar position, you know, we understand that returning excess. Capital is an important part of uh, of creating shareholder value, and you know we have the ability to to do so quickly. But um, I go back to the forces at, at play of why we're operating where we are right now. Got it. Th- thank you, Andrew. If I could just ask one more on the loan yield increase up about fifty eight basis points this quarter. Uh, how much of that increase was the impact from Walmart for the fall quarter, and was there any impact on the APR? from any increase to the APR in response to the proposed CFPB late fee rule. Thanks. And John, I just want to make sure I understand your, your question of the yield uh, quarter over quarter, you're saying, or like year yeah, over year so yield and card. Yeah, year over year yield and card is uh, flat when you take uh, into account the effect of Walmart. Quarter over quarter, it's really just the seasonality effect. There's the partial quarter of Walmart, but yield is really uh, the, the seasonal effects and partial quarter of, of Walmart uh, when you're comparing third quarter to the, the second quarter. Okay. And then... Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. And our final question comes from the line of Jeff Adelson with Morgan Stanley. You may proceed. Hey, good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just just one for me to follow up on, on John's question there. Um, just on the late fee rule, I fully appreciate that things remain in flux at this point. Um, but could you give us an update in your latest thinking and how you're potentially preparing for that with any offsets or mitigating actions? Um, have any of those actions been taken yet? And, you know, I get that you talked about taking a more mindful approach here. Um, just, just wanted to make sure that this is still the same approach you're taking or if there's anything else we should be uh, thinking about in our models here. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Jeff. So at this point, we're waiting for industry litigation to play out to see if and when the late fee rule goes into effect. And, you know, we're not going to predict when that will happen. Uh, As we've said before, if the rule is implemented in its current form, it will have a significant impact on our revenue. But we also believe that the rule will have an impact on the marketplace, including competition, pricing, customer behavior, uh, volumes, credit. The reality is that we have spent decades painstakingly building a customer-first franchise with the fewest fees in the industry and extremely simple products. We believe that we've been rewarded for these choices with better growth, better attrition, and better credit selection. Ultimately, we will work backwards from what preserves our customer franchise, our customer loyalty, and credit resilience if the rule does go into effect. Uh, Relative to anything that we've done so far, um, we uh, really the only thing we've done is we did defer a few investments in anticipation of this rule being implemented. If the ruling never happens, we will likely go ahead and make these investments over time. Thank you, Jeff. Well, that concludes our Q&A session for the evening. Thank you for joining us on this conference call today and for your continuing interest in Capital One. Everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.